Good morning. Our circuit assembly will now begin with a musical prelude. You may wish to review while listening quietly to the music. Doing so will help prepare your heart for today's assembly. Please take your seats and enjoy the music. Jeová é fortaleza 
fortaleza Bem seguros vamos estar Apenas mais um pouco E os maus acabarão Mas quem for manso e justo Terá salvação Não temos nada a temer Pois Deus do mal nos vai esconder As asas dele cobrem Quem o serve Oh, we know. 
Welcome to our circuit assembly. We know that you have been looking forward to gathering together for worship. The assembly theme is not ashamed of the good news, which is taken from Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Today's program will build appreciation for the good news and motivate us to share it with others. To begin, we invite you to stand and sing together song number 67 entitled, Preach the Word. Afterward, Brother Jay Park, a member of the Bethel family, will offer our opening prayer. Again, that's song number 67. Why do some not accept the good news? What can help us to continue declaring it with zeal? Please listen closely to Brother William Malenfant, helper to the teaching committee of the governing body, who is serving as the branch representative of this assembly as he discusses the theme, We are not ashamed of the good news. Why? Brother Malenfant, you have our attention. First of all, I would like to pass on to all of you gathered here today the warm love and the greetings from the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and from the Bethel family. Perhaps you've heard the saying, no news? is good news. Well, the fact of the matter is that no news simply means that you've heard nothing. However, we are not no news people. We proclaim the good news about Jehovah God's kingdom. 
And Jesus Christ is the one who gave us the commission to preach the good news of the kingdom everywhere to everyone that we possibly can. And think about it just for a moment. Is there anything better than hearing about everlasting life without sickness, no suffering? Really? The news that our dead loved ones are going to be brought back to life, resurrected in a beautiful new world? The news that that new world is close at hand? There's no better news anywhere in the universe right now than those points that I just mentioned. You would think when you hear the good news about all of these beautiful things that people everywhere would just say, it's wonderful, I want to know about this. What a wonderful thing it is. It's such good news. But isn't it strange how not all people respond that way? Some people really don't love the idea that we share such beautiful news with people in the field. They don't welcome it. In fact, there are some people who may even feel embarrassed about the good news because they're embarrassed about perhaps expressing faith in God, being viewed by others as a person who really believes in spiritual things, or they really just don't care at all about such spiritual matters. They think it's foolishness, nonsense. Take your Bible and let's read Romans 1.16 and see how the Apostle Paul felt about the good news. Romans chapter 1, six, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, and it's the first part of the verse. Paul declared, For I am not ashamed of the good news. And that's how we feel too. We are not ashamed of being Jehovah's Witnesses and being proclaimers of the good news about God's kingdom. But the question does come up, since this good news of the kingdom is so wonderful, why is it that it is not widely accepted? And why do some people scorn or look down not only on the kingdom good news, but also they scorn and look down on those who go out and preach it, who proclaim it? Well, there are a number of reasons why that exists. We know there are reasons why it existed in the first century, and it also exists in the same way in our time. Back in the first century, men lived and died in the quest for honor, reputation, fame. They wanted to be approved by people around them. They wanted to be respected. The Apostle Paul was raised in that environment. So before he became the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, he had that same mental attitude that permeated the whole world at that time, especially where the Jews were, the Greeks were, the Romans were, of that pride of individuality. But he changed, of course, when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. But that was the mental attitude of Greeks, Romans, and Jews in the first century of pride. And the Jews felt that their salvation would come by following the law and trusting in Abraham. But they didn't want some man who was looked upon as a despised criminal who was put to death thinking that he was going to save us. The Jews had the misconception, that misconception because they failed to understand the scriptures. When Jesus came as a man the first time, it was to offer a sacrifice. When he would come the second time is when he comes in kingdom power. But they only saw the second time. And that's why they despised what Jesus was and what he did. So they viewed Jesus as weak, someone who was nailed to a torture stake. They wanted immediate deliverance from Rome, and they didn't get it. And what about non-Jews or Gentiles? For example, Greeks. Well, they viewed the good news that was preached back in the first century as absolute nonsense. After all, they, they, they felt that Jesus Christ, this Jew who was a despised criminal, why would he have to die in order to save us? They didn't understand that teaching at all. But Paul's words at 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 23 can help us. Let's look them up and see why what Jehovah has to tell us in his word about being despised and so forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 21 
through 23, and Paul explains matters to us here. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not get to know God through its wisdom, God was pleased through the foolishness of what is preached to save those believing. Paul understood the problem back then in the first century with the Greeks viewing the truth as foolishness. And then he went on in verse 22, he says, For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks look for wisdom. And then verse 23, But we, Christians, we preach Christ executed on the stake. To the Jews, a cause for stumbling. But to the nations, foolishness. Paul had a very good understanding of the mentality of people in his day. And you know, the mentality or the outlook on Jesus and what he did, it really is not much different today. There are many people who believe all kinds of false ideas, false rumors and teachings today, just as the Jews and the Greeks believed back in the first century. The Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And yet today, how many people around the globe view us as apostates because we don't believe in the Trinity? But we know, no, Jesus was the Son of God. That's what the Scripture tells us very clearly. He was not God himself. And besides, the word Trinity doesn't occur in the Holy Scriptures in any place. There are professed Christians today that mistakenly assert that God's kingdom is a condition of the heart. If you feel good in your heart, it means you've received God's kingdom. But did that really change anything on this planet? No, it's absurd. It's nonsense. And then there are those who think that the kingdom of God is going to be brought about by human efforts, politicians. Oh, really? We look at the world today and what's going on in the political world, and is that a form, is that a manifestation of the kingdom of God? Hardly. And then there are some who sim view Jesus simply as a good man or a fictional character that they don't take seriously. So many people on the wor in the world today view the good news that we preach as foolishness. And the truth of the matter about people and their attitude about the good news that the Bible speaks of and that we take to people in our work from door to door is set forth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Read it with me, please. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And this is what's taking place, why people are so blind. It says, Among whom the God of this system of things has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that the illumination of the glorious good news about the Christ, who is the image of God, might not shine through. Notice it blinds the minds of the unbelievers. And the unbelievers in this verse are not just atheists. Unbelievers are those of Christendom also. They do not believe correctly when they think Jesus was God. That is an unbeliever. They have to believe what the scriptures really teach to be believers. And Satan has blinded the minds of so many people because they adhere to all kinds of false teachings, false doctrines. So the truth of the matter is we are not ashamed of the good news. And the, the apostle Paul explained why he was not ashamed of the good news. Take your Bible and let's read now the entire scripture at Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read the whole verse, verse 16, once again. This is what Paul said. For I am not ashamed of the good news. Now, we read that earlier, but now what does Paul go on to tell us? Why is he not ashamed? What's the value of the good news of God's kingdom to us? This is what Paul said. It is, in fact, God's power for salvation to everyone having faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone having faith, really believing the good news that the Bible proclaims. You know, many people don't understand and don't appreciate that the, the originator of the good news is Jehovah God. It's not our origination. We're not preaching a message of our own development, our own making. This is a message from Jehovah God. 
And Paul, he had a wonderful attitude about the good news and declaring it, even though before he learned the good news, he was a persecutor of Christians. He had no real faith. He didn't understand the scriptures. He was among those Jews who thought that the Messiah was supposed to free the Jewish nation back in the first century and create their own empire. But no, he came to know the truth. In fact, let's read Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. This is the attitude that the, the Apostle Paul developed in connection with the good news about God's kingdom. Romans 11, verse 13. Now I speak to you who are people of the nations, seeing that I am an apostle to the nations. And what did Paul say about his preaching work? I glorify my ministry. Paul really appreciated the message that he was carrying to the nations about the kingdom of Jehovah God. It was a great honor for the Apostle Paul to be a conveyor of the good news foretold in Scripture. And when he said he glorifies his ministry, what that really means is he magnifies it. He takes pride in it. And isn't that how we feel? We have the good news about the kingdom. We know what's coming in the, into this world very shortly. And we glorify, we're delighted that we have, we have this wonderful message to share with people everywhere. And there's another point to keep in mind. When Paul preached about the good news, he was preaching about Jesus Christ coming as Messiah and the coming kingdom. We preach the kingdom established in the heavens and the end is very near. So our message has shifted to the degree that that kingdom is now established and ruling in the heavens. What a privilege we have. This assembly program is going to help all of us take pride in the good news, to feel really good about it, and not to feel intimidated by people who may belittle us or scoff at what the Bible says. What those people do doesn't mean a thing to us. It doesn't matter at all. We, we're out to help everyone we possibly can and just share our hope with people everywhere. Let's cover a few points from the program together. I think you'll enjoy them. Open your program to the very beginning. The first talk, we are not ashamed of the good news. Why? Well, because it's God's power, because we trust Jehovah God. The good news gives us the privilege to show our faith and to honor Jehovah. And so we're, we're fearless. We proclaim it to everyone everywhere. We don't allow people to intimidate us in connection with the good news, or to look down upon us. We really scoff at it. And then the talk that follows this one, taking a stand for the good news. Yes, if you're going to be one of Jehovah's faithful servants, you have to be ready to take a stand. Really stand up for the good news. Don't be intimidated. Don't be fearful about saying what you are, who you are, what you believe. Never be ashamed of the good news or of our great God, Jehovah. And then after that, you're going to hear from your circuit overseer, be a workman with nothing to be ashamed of. And he's going to cover two key points in his presentation, with how we want to use God's word effectively as we preach the good news, and then how we want to be diligent in the ministry. So we look forward to hear from Brother Bulge. Bulge. After his talk, then later on, after the announcements, we're going to have another talk showing the spirit. Now notice the three points in this talk at 11.05. Showing the spirit of power, love, and soundness of mind. So those three key points will receive attention during that talk on how we want to show that spirit. Love, power, love, and soundness of mind. And then at 11.35, we have a part we always enjoy very much, the baptism and we look forward to that talk. For the afternoon program, we'll start out with experiences at 1.35. Uh, and then, as always, we have the great summary of the Watchtower and we enjoy seeing brothers and sisters from one of the congregations covering that material for us. And that's very encouraging. And then we're going to have a symposium. We are not ashamed. Now, those are the points that we're not ashamed of. Because there are people who would be ashamed of the stand we take on morality. 
They're intimidated by this world. They want to be extremely liberal and please everybody. No, if you love the truth, you can't please everybody. You love the truth, you treat people kindly, but you take a firm stand for what you know is right. And that's why it says God's moral standards. We're not going to change to please people. But we don't go about campaigning against people who don't observe God's moral standards. We're going to see some very interesting points on that subject. The next one, God's kingdom. How could we possibly be ashamed of the government that Jehovah God has set up and that's going to rule the new earth? And then the third point, God's representatives. We are not ashamed of our brothers, especially the governing body. They're God's representatives. They've helped provide us. They don't make the spiritual food that we get, no. They're the chefs. They prepare it. It's all in the Bible. All the spiritual food is there. The governing body works on that spiritual food, looks through the scriptures to understand the things, and then they convey to us that spiritual food. They prepare it so we can understand it and digest it. And then in the, the, the afternoon, the last talk of the day, boast in Jehovah. Well, you know, a lot of people boast about a lot of things, about how much money they make and how important they think they are and many, many other things. Puny little man boasting is really quite an amazing thing. He's here for a very short period of time and he's gone and he, all his boss boasting goes with him. If we boast, we always want to boast in Jehovah, our great God of the heavens. So this assembly program is going to help us appreciate so many good points from the scriptures that we can apply. And I'm going to ask you now the review question. Why are we not ashamed of the good news? The answer, Romans 1.16 and Romans 11.13. The good news comes from Jehovah God and brings salvation to those who accept it. That is the basic reason why we are not ashamed of it. So, brothers and sisters, may all of us continue to strengthen our confidence in the good news of the kingdom and strengthen our love for it. You know, you have to love Jehovah, love your fellow man, and love the truth, love the good news. Read with me this last scripture we're going to touch on, brothers. It's at Psalm 119. And verses 46 and 47. Psalm 119, verses 46 and 47. This is how we feel about it. Verse 46. I will speak about your reminders in front of kings, and I will not be ashamed. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely fearless, presenting the truth of God's word to others. And then the reason we are able to do it, what does it say in verse 47? I am fond of your commandments. Yes, I love them. That's how we feel. So may you enjoy this beautiful program that's been prepared for all of us, and may Jehovah's rich blessing be upon all the arrangements for this assembly. Thank you, Brother Malenfan, for emphasizing why we are proud to bear your name. We are looking forward to hearing the rest of the assembly program and to getting better acquainted with you and your wife throughout the day. How can we make Jehovah, Jesus, and the angels rejoice? Please give your attention to Brother Robert Lefevre from the South Schenectady Congregation as he presents the talk, Taking a Stand for the Good News. Have you ever done something well that made you feel really good? Maybe it was a family recipe that you got from your mother or your grandmother. You followed the directions and it came out beautiful tasted great. How did you feel? You're pretty happy about that, wasn't it? For a job well done. But then you're probably very excited. You might even have gotten on the phone and called your mother and said, I just did this recipe that you gave me and it came out really good. So not only were you happy, but now your mother too was all smiles. 
we feel good when we do the right thing. Now, as Jehovah's people, we've been given a big job to do. We've been asked to courageously share the good news. And when we take a firm stand for the truth and give a witness, we naturally feel good about it. But it's more than that. It's not just us that feels good. We need to consider also how the one that gave us the assignment feels. When we do the right thing, when we take a firm stand for the good news, Jehovah rejoices. Christ Jesus rejoices and the angels in heaven rejoice as well. Jesus is proud to call us his disciples when we take a stand for the good news. Notice where he said this in the book of Matthew chapter 10 in verse 32. Matthew chapter 10 in verse 32. Jesus' words, Everyone then who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father who is in the heavens. Really encouraging words, isn't it? When we acknowledge Jesus, he acknowledges us. Not only does he see us, but he acknowledges us to Jehovah God himself in the heavens. Jesus also gave a warning. While we are not ashamed of the good news, Jesus warned that those that disown the faith and become ashamed of the good news and his teachings, he would disown those individuals. But for us, we're not ashamed of the good news. We take our stand repeatedly, and that's good news. It's good that we're able to do that. But what about when we're under pressure? Sometimes when we feel pressure building, it may be difficult for us to take a stand for the good news. We may be tempted to perhaps hold back a little bit in our beliefs. Well, what can we do in that situation? Well, sometimes that happens. But there's other times when we have to take decisive action. Some situations call for us to speak up and boldly defend the good news. Many of us are familiar with an account in Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 3, there is a, there's the account with three Hebrew boys. They were known in Babylon as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these young men, they were pulled out in front of the king, and they were told, you have to do what everyone else is doing. You have to bow down to an image. Well, that was a time for decisive action. What would these young men, these boys, do in a situation like that? Well, in part, Daniel chapter 3 gives a response. These young men, they said this, Let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Decisive. No doubt Jehovah and Jesus were proud of those young men taking a, fan, a firm stand for the truth. But what would we do in a similar situation? We may think about that in front of a, the nation and the king, and how could we take a stand like these young men did? What if I'm not able to, to take a stand like that? Well, we can. Jehovah's people repeatedly have taken a firm stand for the truth, even though it may be challenging. Well, what gives them the strength to do this? How are we able to take a stand in sometimes what are very difficult circumstances? Well, let's return to Scripture. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, it says, so that, we may have be, so that we may be of good courage and say, Jehovah is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? We think about that. With Jehovah as our helper, we have no need to be afraid. Faith in Jehovah conquers fear of man. So the stronger our faith, the less fear we're going to have. But what if we fail to handle a matter on a day-to-day -day basis? Perhaps a situation comes up and we have an opportunity to give a witness, but we don't do it as well as we would have liked. <coughs> Excuse me. What could we do in those circumstances? Well, remember the illustration of the recipe at the beginning? If you had tried to make that dish and you followed the recipe and it didn't come out so good, 
a little sad, a little disappointed, but you'd return to that recipe again, wouldn't you? You'd go back to that recipe and you'd be determined to get it right. Well, that's the same thing we need to do if we miss an opportunity to preach the good news. Think about the example of the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter, he failed to uh, acknowledge Jesus. Three times he denied him. How do we think Peter felt at that point in time? You think Peter felt sad? You think Peter felt disappointed? Absolutely. But what happened when he had an opportunity to give a witness in the future? If we look in the book of Acts, we see just what Peter did. In Acts chapter 4, it speaks about Peter as being an outspoken individual. And then in Acts chapter 5, the highest court in the land, it said, we strictly ordered you not to keep teaching or preaching the good news. Peter's response, along with the other apostles, we must obey God as ruler rather than men. Where did this come from? How was Peter able to go from denying the Christ to standing before the highest court in the land and taking a firm stand for the good news? Well, we know of Peter's circumstances. Perhaps his negative experience in the beginning strengthened his determination to stand firm in the future. Can you see Peter making that decision? If I ever have an opportunity again to preach the good news or to take a firm stand, I'm going to take it. And that's exactly what the apostle Peter did. If at times we do not speak up as we would like, we can learn from the experience, strengthen our faith, and pray for boldness, and then we can do better next time. In the following demonstration, a workmate approaches our sister and wants her to support a political movement. Let's see how she handles the situation. Allie, I am so excited for the rally tonight. The whole city is coming to support the cause. Hey, let's ride together. We have room in our car. I don't think I'll be going. What? Why not? You know the movement needs our support. I'm just too busy. I have too much to do. Seriously? Okay, don't worry. There will be a rally every night this week. We'll work it out. Talk to you later. That evening, our sister speaks with her husband. Let's listen in on part of their conversation. I'm so disappointed in myself and the excuses I gave. Hmm. I understand. Sometimes it can be hard to find the right words, especially when we're caught off guard. Um... Tonight, after dinner, let's pray and then do research on boldness and neutrality. And then maybe tomorrow you can bring it up again with your coworker. Maybe I can. Okay, so now the next day, our sister approaches her workmate. Let's see what happens. Hi, Kristen. I just wanted to talk to you about yesterday. I want to clarify why I wasn't at the rally last night and why I'm not planning on being at any of the rallies. I said I was busy, and that's true. But the main reason is that I don't take sides in political issues. Well, is that because of your religion? It's because of what I've learned from the Bible. Can I show you some principles that I live by? You mean the Bible talks about whether you should go to political rallies? It has actually taught me whom I should support. Really? Yes. Notice what it says here at John 18, 36. By praying and doing research, our sister found the courage to revisit the situation and give a bold witness. We can do the same. We can learn from the experience as our sister did. Strengthen our faith, pray for boldness, and do better next time.
See, if we courageously share the good news with others, if we boldly take a stand for what is right, well, there's going to be a reward. Notice one more scripture here in the book of Romans this time, chapter 10 in verse 9. What is going to result when we take a stand for the good news? Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says, For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Publicly declare. Speak up. Take a bold stand for the truth. When we do that, Jesus tells us through scripture that we will be saved. Our bold witnessing is essential. Our taking a firm stand for the good news, it's going to help us on the road to getting life. But there's more to it. When we boldly take a stand for the good news, when we speak out and talk to others, people respond. And when individuals respond to the good news, not only do we feel good, but we're getting them started on the road to everlasting life. When that happens, not only do we feel good, but there's a rejoicing in the heavens. We think about that. You know, our actions affect what happens in heaven. See, we can make Jehovah happy. We can make the angels happy. We can make our Lord and Master, Christ Jesus, happy. But what if we try to give a witness and it doesn't, it doesn't go so well? Perhaps we're in the ministry and people don't respond or we're trying some informal witnessing or public witnessing, and we don't get a positive result. Well, that's okay. Because we know that when we take a firm stand for the truth, we know we've done that. Jehovah knows we've done that. And Jesus knows that we've done that as well. We've done the right thing. And when we do the right thing, we can feel good about that. Now, let's review what we've talked about. How do we take a stand for the good news? Our review question. Well, there's two scriptures that we really highlighted. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 and Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. So the answer, how do we take a stand for the good news? We courageously share the good news and boldly declare our support for Jehovah, his son, and the kingdom. Be determined to take a firm stand for the good news. If you do that, you'll have everlasting blessings. And a firm stand for the good news will bring you joy. You're going to feel good. But it also makes the heavens rejoice. When we take a firm stand for the good news, the angels, all those angels that are looking on, they rejoice. Our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, he sees what we're doing, following the, the recipe, so to speak, and he rejoices as well. And ultimately, when we take a firm stand for the good news, we can be proud that Jehovah rejoices in the heavens. Thank you, Brother Lefevre, for that encouraging talk. What motivates us to work diligently in the ministry? How can we use God's word effectively to help others that we meet? Please listen as our circuit overseer, Brother Jared Balch, presents the talk, Be a Workman with Nothing to Be Ashamed Of. When you see the work of an artist, do you feel at times you can see their personality? Similarly, when we see the results of the global preaching and teaching work today, isn't it clear evidence of how Jehovah's people, how we feel about our work? Yes, it's just as the Apostle Paul expressed in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, we are eager to declare the good news and we commend all in our audience for your fine spirit. But now the question is, how can we individually cultivate and maintain this spirit? 
Let's answer that question by turning our Bibles to our theme scripture for this talk. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's read and discuss verse 15 together. Again, that's 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Notice here, under inspiration, what the Apostle Paul tells the younger man, Timothy, his protege. He says, do your utmost to present yourself approved to God. Notice our theme for this talk. A workman with nothing to be ashamed of, handling the word of truth, of the truth aright. So notice first, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to do his utmost. Well, we know Timothy loved his ministry. What was the Apostle Paul encouraging him to continue to do? Well, if you notice the study note here, it says the expression means that he was urging Timothy to be zealous, to be eager, to take pain, so it would not always be easy to make every effort, and to be conscientious about his ministry. Now, keep in mind the setting. We know the Apostle Paul was in prison. His death was imminent, and yet the Apostle Paul was never ashamed of the good news. What do we learn from his powerful example? Well, our circumstances may limit the amount of work we're involved in, but it does not have to put limitations on our feelings about the work and also the quality of it. So why do we do our utmost? Well, that question is also answered in verse 15. Notice the answer. We desire Jehovah's continued approval. So how can we be good workers with no cause for shame? How can we receive Jehovah's approval? Well, we're going to highlight two points throughout this talk. One, we want to do our utmost or work diligently in the ministry. And then two, we want to handle the word of the truth aright. Or in other words, we want to use God's word effectively. So let's begin with the thought, working diligently in the ministry. What motivates us? Well, we know in a word that is love. We love the source. We love the topic. We love the king. And we love people, don't we? Let's discuss those one at a time. Beginning with the source. We love the source of our message Jehovah God. And because we love the source, we will never be ashamed of the work. Notice how that's expressed in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, let's consider verse 23. Again, that's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. We'll read the beginning of verse 23 and then we'll consider the context for just a moment. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, it begins, whatever you are doing. Now, what does that include? Well, just notice the context. Verse 22, how we act, react at our secular work as Christians. Verses 18 through 21, how we treat our families. Verses 15 through 17, how we encourage our spiritual brothers and sisters, verses 12 through 14, displaying the Christian personality, and of course, verses 5 through 9, resisting temptation. This also includes what we find in chapter 4. In chapter 4, notice what the Apostle Paul tells a fellow soldier of Christ, Archippus. Do you see that? He tells him, Pay attention to the ministry that you accepted in the Lord in order to fulfill it. Now, isn't that how we feel? We have accepted a ministry. We love that ministry. We love the source, and we want to fulfill it. But now let's go back, back to verse 23. Notice the key found here in verse 23. Whatever you are doing, work at it whole-souled as for Jehovah. 
Now notice the caution, and not for man. Yes, as humans, we can't ignore the reaction of others, but we can choose our focus. What should be our primary focus? Praising Jehovah. And as we praise Jehovah, we know that we will continue to receive his spirit. We will be able to joyfully preach the good news, and we will never be ashamed of it. Let's consider the second. We love the topic of our message, don't we? We love the kingdom. Why? Well, as expressed in our opening talk, we know it's the only permanent solution to every problem facing mankind. Now, just think about how eager individuals are today, groups are, in supporting a person, a party, or a government that's imperfect, faulty, temporary at best. But the solution to false religion, human rulership, wickedness, sickness and death, environmental problems, poverty, true peace and security, and we could go on, couldn't we? We know it's the kingdom. The kingdom is not a band-aid. Rather, it's the solution because it gets to the core of the problems that exist. Satan and the devil, imperfection, and of course, the spirit of this world that dominates mankind's thinking. There's another reason that we love the kingdom, and that is we love that we have a purpose, and we love our work, don't we? We love our work because we're playing a part in the greatest issue facing all intelligent creation, and that is the sanctification and the vindication of Jehovah's name, and that is not something to be ashamed of. Consider the third, we love the king who is central to our message, Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's consider verse 8. Now, Peter is writing to an audience very similar to ours. How is that? 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Here it reads, Though you never saw him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, Yet you exercise faith in him and are greatly rejoicing with an indescribable and glorious joy. So who was Peter writing to? He was writing writing to individuals that had never seen Jesus in the flesh. But they loved him just as we do. Now, you can love someone without seeing them, but you cannot love someone without knowing them. So how did they know Jesus Christ? Well, one reason they could form a relationship and friendship with Jesus is because by the time Peter wrote this letter, at least two gospels, Matthew and Luke, were already in circulation. But also ones like Peter could explain firsthand what kind of person Jesus was. So why do we love our king? For similar reasons. One, because we have gotten to know Jesus based on what we read in God's Word, the Bible, and not just two books, but 66 books of the Bible. Another reason that we love our king is because of what we clearly seeing him do today. We clearly see his presence as king. We see him as our high priest, our wonderful counselor, and we see what he's doing within the congregation as its head. Now, how many masters do you know, past and present, that love working with their slaves? Yet that is exactly what Jesus has done, and that is what he is doing today. He's not only given us the commission, but he started the work, and Jesus was never ashamed of it. As we follow his example, as we remain under his yoke, Jesus promises to be with us. He promises to refresh us, and because of this, we will never be ashamed of the good news. 
Consider the last. We love the people who may respond to our message, potentially anyone we meet. So we remain hopeful, knowing lives are at stake. Now, can you imagine for just a moment a rescue worker and they show up uh, on the scene and there's complete devastation all around them and all they can think in their mind is this, there is absolutely no hope. Now, would that affect their demeanor, disposition? Would it affect their spirit? Would it affect their work? Now, consider the example, again, of Jesus. See, Jesus knew ones like his brothers would initially be indifferent to the message, but he remained patient, knowing that later they would be impacted by the things that he said and by the things that he did. Why are Jehovah and Jesus so patient with people? It's because they dearly love them. Consider an example of a brother in Ethiopia. He said this when it was written, For more than 20 years, I was the only witness in a seldom work territory. 20 years. Then he says, But now... There are 14 publishers, 13 of them got baptized, including my wife and three children. Now we have an average of 32 people at the meetings. Do you think this dear brother has anything to be ashamed of? Of course not. But why is he a workman with nothing to be ashamed of? It's not the results. It's the qualities displayed, his patience his endurance, his effort, and what fuels these qualities, our primary one, love. Now let's consider our second point. We want to use God's word effectively. Let's return to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's again highlight what the apostle Paul expressed at the end of this verse. And again, we'll consider the a Greek expression here, and also the context. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, we should handle the word of the truth aright. So what does this mean? Well, it includes building people up with God's word and comforting them. Now, the Greek verbiage here means to cut in a straight line or in a straight path. Now, if any of you have ever had to cut on a straight line, maybe construction materials as a child, construction paper, or maybe fabric, you know the importance of doing so. So what was Paul expressing to Timothy? If he wanted to be a workman with nothing to be ashamed of, he needed to center his attention always on the Word of God. What's involved? Well, more than just teaching it accurately. We want to explain it with accuracy, but also notice the context here. What does Paul tell Timothy in verse 14? He says, not to fight about words. In verse 16, to reject empty speeches. So to use God's word effectively, he's telling him to avoid debates. See, our ministry is not about proving a point to someone. And if it were, what would it be? to show love, to show love in what we say, sometimes what we don't say, what we do, and sometimes what we avoid doing. And that is one of the many reasons that we love our new brochure, Love People, Make Disciples. Now, since God's word is the greatest tool we have, a greatest weapon in our arsenal, what might we call our new brochure? Well, we may think of it as an instruction manual. Why? Because again, it's designed to help us to use God's word more effectively in our ministry. Let's consider an example together. Now, instead of providing scripted presentations, and we are very thankful for that. Instead of providing scripted presentations, it just helps us to show love by displaying different qualities, like showing a personal interest in others. And when we show sincere personal interest, we'll talk about a subject or a topic that they're interested in that's on their mind. 
After all, can you imagine a doctor who doesn't address our own personal needs? So this brochure asks us questions that stimulates our thinking so that we can be more adaptable and more flexible in our ministry. Let's look at two examples. Do you have your brochure with you? Maybe the electronic, in electronic form? So just tap on library, unless it's one of your favorites, you can go to a uh, home, your home tab. So just tap on library, uh, go to brochures, love people, make disciples brochure. And we're going to look at lesson one, interest in others. And of course, we know that this account is about Jesus with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. What can we learn from this example? Well, among other things, how Jesus started this conversation, how did he do so? Uh, by observing observations lead to great conversations at times. Just, in, just like in this case, what did he observe? Well, he acknowledged who she was, what she was doing, her faith, her religion. So before we speak, we should ask ourselves the question, like Jesus, what have we observed? Now let's look at a second example. Notice lesson two, it's on naturalness. And here we have the example of Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. So let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Notice what Philip observed in his personal ministry in this account. So Acts chapter 8, we're going to start with verse 26. So here in verse 26, it says that the angel spoke to Philip saying, get up and go too. So he receives very specific directions on where to go from the angel. But now notice in verse 27 and 28, what does Philip no doubt have to observe for himself? Who the man was, his secular work, we might stay, say. The end of verse 27, where he had been, and in verse 28, what he was doing. He was reading aloud the prophet Isaiah. So in this account, it doesn't say that the angel told Philip who the man was, what he was doing, or where he was coming from. Again, these were observations that Philip no doubt made for himself. So what's the lesson? The Spirit is helping us. The angels are directing us, but we start conversations based on our observations. And now, what does this turn into? A beautiful discussion. You notice how it's natural. It just flows into a natural conversation with the Ethiopian eunuch. At the end of verse 30, he just asked the question, do you actually know what you are reading? So just imagine being in that setting, a similar setting, not that we would be ever running beside a car or a chariot, but maybe we come across an individual, a schoolmate, a workmate, or maybe in the door-to-door -door ministry, we find someone reading. What would we ask them? Would you like something else to read? Hopefully not at this point. But we might find out what they're reading. Is it about science? Is it about religion? Is it about history, parenting, schooling? Or it could be anything else. Can we take what they're doing, what they're reading, and adapt it to share a truth that we love? Now, let's see in the following demonstration how we might imitate Jesus and Philip in our own ministry so that we too can be a workman with nothing to be ashamed of. Hi, I noticed as I was coming up the walkway, oh my goodness, this, this garden is gorgeous. Thank you. I live here with my parents and they let me take care of the yard. Well, a job well done. And oh, you have one of my favorite flowers, the hibiscus. That's gorgeous too. They're my favorite too. I find them so difficult to take care of, but it's definitely worth the reward. Absolutely. And you know, now that I look around, I see that you have some vegetable plants that are added right in with the flowers. Yeah, that's my way of showing what the earth can do for us. If we just take care of it, instead of bringing it to ruins like people are, you know, they act like we have another planet we are going to live on. I appreciate that, what you said. I'm sorry, my name is Lisa. May I ask your name? I'm Jamie. Jamie, it's nice to meet you. And what you've done here really does give evidence of the earth's ability and its potential. But you're right, so many times people don't show any appreciation for the earth, and they do so much that ruins it. 
You know, but you made a good point. I've talked with other people that have said that they wonder whether this earth will even be able to continue to exist. Jamie, have you ever mentioned or thought of a, 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 a text or a, a thought that a person brought out that he said something that might have caught your mind, your, your thought? It's about the, the end, the, how things are going to be. You know, I have it here on my phone. It's actually a, an expression from a gentleman from many years ago. And notice what he says here. A generation is going and a generation is coming but the earth remains forever. So it's interesting there when we read that first part, it says a generation is going, a generation is coming. You know, we see the fact of that. I know myself personally, my, my parents, my grandparents were already deceased before I was born, but he continues to mention there something else. He, he uses the word but showing a contrast, but he says, but the earth remains for how long? It says forever. Yes. Isn't that an interesting point? That is interesting. What I just read to you was actually from God's Word, the Bible. It was the writer was a man named Solomon, and he expressed his opinion and his thoughts about the stability of the earth. But that's not the only thing that the Bible says about the earth. Matter of fact, it talks about how even our Creator feels about individuals that are ruining the earth. You know, on Friday, I'll be right on this same street. Would it be okay if I stop by right here in the garden and share with you that positive thought about what the earth can be like in the future? Yeah, I'm sure I'll be here. Excellent. I look forward to seeing you right here in the garden. <laughs> well done. Thank you for that beautiful demonstration. Now, did you notice how the publisher show genuine interest in the person. She just simply, like Jesus, like Philip, she just simply observed what she was doing. And then when it was natural to do so, she introduced a truth that she loved to teach. By doing so, she created an opportunity to give a fine witness without forcing it. We commend you for doing the same. We know that you are working hard in applying these beautiful qualities found in our new brochure. You're not only teaching the truth, but you're applying the truth by displaying qualities that make the truth more attractive to those that are honest hearted. Our review question for this talk is, what makes us effective workers in the ministry? Based on 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, motivated by love, we share truths from God's word in a natural way that appeals to our listeners. Now let's repeat that answer. Motivated by love, we share truths from God's word in a natural way that appeals to our listeners. Many years ago, I asked a mature brother how he accomplished so much in Jehovah's service. In my mind, from my vantage point, it seemed impossible. And he took just a moment and he responded with just two words. Do you know what those two words were? Can you guess? He said, love people. Isn't that true? How can we be a workman with nothing to be ashamed of? Love. We want to love the source. We want to love the topic, God's kingdom. We want to love our King Jesus. We want to love people. And we might add, we want to love handling the word of truth aright. It's this love that will motivate us to continue to use God's word effectively, to start conversations naturally so that we can help others who are rightly disposed for everlasting life also be a workman with nothing to be ashamed of. Thank you, Brother Balch and your participants for providing those practical suggestions. 
Let us now stand and sing together song number 73 entitled, Grant Us Boldness. After the song, you may wish to remain standing for some announcements. Again, that's song number 73. Thank you. 